What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of Hint Water, RX Bars, P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25, we host in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many in the e-commerce industry. We hosted them in Chicago, Austin, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, and others across the country. We just got back from Las Vegas. And uh, so if you see your, yourself in uh, the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect, check out Rise25 and Ask us where our next event's going to be. Um, I also want to do a thank you shout out to Azrael Ratz, who hails all the way from Israel, for introducing me to today's awesome guest. Uh, Azrael uh, helps companies find their ideal audiences on Facebook and create more sales. And he can be found at Rats Pack Media, not like Frank Sinatra Rats Pack, but his last name, R A T Z Pack Media. Um, today I'm very excited because you'll see at the end of the intro. I've been waiting for, for weeks for this special after intro intro. Um, but today, you'll see what I mean in a second. But today we have Habib Salo, CEO of Young Nails, that's been serving the nail care industry for over 20 years. Uh, Habib and Greg, Habib's older brother, run the business, and their mom decided to start her own business at the ripe age of 49. And she had a passion for the nail industry and they did everything in their power to support her. And it's interesting because Greg, uh, your older brother, became a licensed nail technician after switching gears from what I would visualize the opposite of that, which is firefighters <laughs> training. The, That's the right. manliest, manliest man <laughs> type of people um, work and going to yep. license nail technician. So it's That's not right. what I would expect. And, and you took a detour from medical school and a life in music to do right. this. And uh, for anyone, Young Nails is a professional nail care manufacturing company exporting to over 40 countries worldwide and distributing domestically to over 3,000 stores. Javi, thanks for joining me. Thank you and very, what very was much the for intro us. after the intro? What was the what? I'm sorry. The nails. I, I need the intro. You're in the intro. I need you doing about the nails. Oh, oh, our. Uh, well, so so here's the thing. We've I have like there's like three different intros. There's the nail school, which is uh, the same one that I do every single time, and then there's our biz talks that we do that are also uh, right now on the biz talk. And then I do right now on nail school, which has become this thing that, uh, our, our customers now will like call and see me and they're basically hitting me with the intro every single time. What is it? Tell me. Yeah. Uh, basically every, before every intro, I say the same thing, which is, you know, we're going to explore how to apply nail polish on the nails right now on nail school. And they literally will walk up to me at shows and events and just walk up to my face and start saying the intro before we get into the, uh, the videos, which is really funny. It's a lot of fun. It's really so, cool. So, you know, we were talking before we started about reinvention, reinventing Correct. yourselves. Um, yeah. so talk about that for a second. Yeah. We've had to completely reinvent ourselves as a company. And that started about 18 months ago, Jeremy. We saw that um, the market, our market was changing, not only our market, but just how communication happens today. We saw that changing. We wanted to jump on it. Um, we were doing a ton of traditional print, a ton of traditional uh, types of marketing, trade shows, mailers, and honestly, our business had plateaued, hmm. and we we hit a wall. So, I myself and my brother were having a lot of conversations about moving to social, and we were on social, but not really aggressive on social. So, we took the leap of faith of um, just what doing were you it. seeing in the trends that you had to switch at the time? We. The, the first thing was like attendance and trade shows was completely down. 
So we would, we would go to these events, and this was the number one way that we actually built our business in the late 90s and early 2000. So we saw attendance was down, revenue was down. The trade shows were telling us, oh, no, everything's fine. Hey, don't worry about it. You're good. But obviously, sales were down. And just the traffic, you look in the aisles, and it was like there's nobody here. And what we started hearing from a lot of our clients was – well, there's no reason to go anymore because um, if you guys are going to launch a product, we see it on Facebook. Mm. If you guys are going to, you know, do some type of event, you know, a company's going to do an event. We'll go to Facebook or Instagram, and we were doing a lot of like instructional videos on YouTube. And so they say, well, if we want to learn a new technique, we know you guys are going to launch it on YouTube. And so we were like, okay, you know, ding, ding, ding. There's something here, and that's us just doing. Uh, social kind of like passively. We yeah. weren't hardcore aggressive. So you didn't have that, a strategy for it. You were just doing it because you know education purposes and, and here and there. But you didn't have a kind correct. of a cons, you know cons, you know strategy for it. That's exactly right. It was more of we know we have to be on social because that you know we people are on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and that's why we did it. But like you said, not as a strategy. It was not part of our like. This is how we're going to like really take it to the next level. So, correct. So, what's worked and not worked on social? Mm. I've watched a bunch of videos. Everyone should check out. What's, uh, tell people your YouTube channel so they can check it out. So, our YouTube channel is Young Nails Inc. That's nails like fingernails. Some yeah. people uh, hear it wrong over audio. <laughs> They'll think it's uh, males as in oh, us, God, I us, it. us dudes, but uh, it's not fingernails. Uh, Young Nails Inc. Um, actually, all of our handles, Instagram, Facebook, everything is Young Nails Inc. They can check that out. Um, what's worked and what has not worked, that is a um, – we're still figuring out what's working. But the best thing that I can say, especially on YouTube, has been um, putting in volume of hours to figure out like just one slight – Getting like a grain of information requires like months and months and months of of shooting, editing, cutting. Shooting, I mean, you guys editing. are doing awesome. I mean, I, if you. you see me looking over here, I mean, I have your your videos pulled up over here. But I yeah. mean, you have at the time over one hundred forty thousand subscribers. We do, we do, and good for you. That it's awesome. Thank you, thank you very much. We're we're still we're still pounding away at it. I, I think like for us, what's worked ultimately has been like learning how to really be transparent. Like this is the biggest thing I can say for us is like we're truly utilizing YouTube and Facebook and Instagram as yeah. a way for people to see inside of our business. Yeah. It's That's funny. You and your brother have a funny dynamic because um, I don't know. He was doing someone I mean, I've never – I have two daughters – and yeah. um, I never thought I'd be. They're like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, um, "I don't know. I'm watching people doing people's nails." <laughs> <laughs> so funny. And uh, but your brother is doing someone's nails, and he kind of does this thing with his hands, and you're like, "You look like you're greedy." And you guys yeah, have yeah, a yeah. funny dynamic, you know? Yeah, we. I like honestly, we we screw around all the time. Like we're constantly messing around. And even at our company, that's part of the company culture is like this looseness and um, – but that's us. I'm like, just curious because, you know, obviously every video you put out, you put a lot of time effort. Like you said, even if it's like a five-minute clip, so much time, effort, energy, planning goes into it. You want everyone to hit – every single video to hit out of the park. So I'm wondering when I'm looking on there, which one was a complete surprise that just, you know, had a ton of views? And which one you're like, this is going to be our next, you know – 100k yeah. video. I mean, I'm looking at one. There's, you know, a powder coating system that has 108,000 views on yeah. it. So, how do you explain some of the ones that took off, and then maybe some of the ones that didn't? That is a great question, and th this is. You can say I have no idea. No, well, <laughs> there's 100, well, part 162, of it. 62,000 views yeah. on one of these. It, here, here's the deal. We, we've actually tried planning to create a video that you know let's create something that we think is going to get all these views and it just flops hmm. like 815,000 views on this other one 
Snake yeah, there, there's yeah, the snake skin. That's one of the that was an older. I think that was in like four or five years ago. I think that was five a while ago. ago. Yeah. yeah, and those were the days when YouTube was for sure a little more. I don't want to say easy. It's never easy, but it was easier to reach an audience hmm. and to get those kind of views. Like today, it's so much harder. But honestly, what we do is we look at, you know, through our Instagram, we get a lot of information as to like what looks are kind of hot and what looks are not. Mm. And that helps to kind of guide us so on. So you kind of look on Instagram, like overall strategy, you kind of look to see what's trending, what's hot, yeah. and then you want to create a video on what's trending. That's exactly correct. We try to do that. So there's two things. We look at what's trending in the market and try to create something. And then we take our experience and our knowledge and say, hey, we think this would be good for the market. Let's give it a shot. So one is more like, you know, data driven and another is more like creative driven and just based off our off our experience. And that's that's honestly how it is. We walk in the door and it's like cameras flip on and we want to capture our personalities. That's the biggest thing. And the culture of our company is number one. And we, we want it to be a little more raw which is why you see things like when my brother's rubbing his hands and I'm like, dude, you're looking greedy, bro. What's going, you know, just these little <laughs> comments is, and that's how we talk to each other and we have a lot of fun doing it. And that's kind of the big, more than anything, that's what we want to capture is like yeah. our day to day, our interaction. You know, we want people, we want that transparency and for people to feel like they're really a part of the company. They're experiencing how we talk to each other every single day. So Screw what around. You it, I love it. And um, what's your production schedule? Like how many pr videos do you want to produce per week or per month? We do five videos a week. Um, so Monday and Wednesdays at 8 a.m. we launch the vlogs. On Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. we do what's called the biz talk. It's more on the business side of, of the, the nail industry. And then on Thursday and Friday – at around noon, like today, at around between noon and one, we launch a more hardcore instructional video. Those are the nail schools, which is all technique and like how, like gets into that's the every week, every single week. That's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, I don't sleep much these days. <laughs> so is <laughs> like, your brother doing most of the instructor? Who's doing the um, instructional ones? He does the instructionals mm. exactly. All so I shoot everything so i'm shooting all the videos and i'm editing myself all wow. the videos um and then but he does the hardcore instructionals and then myself and then we have our director of education she does the business talks with me on tuesdays and then mondays and wednesdays it's all of us on the vlogs um and then we have our instagram which we're pumping out three to four videos a day plus you know four to five stories a day we're on Snapchat. Wow. We're on Facebook. We do Facebook Live once a week. You know, Instagram Live once a week. We rip everything, put it on a podcast. Um, it's not a proper podcast at this point. We're still trying to develop that. It's hard to think how are we going to get a podcast uh, with nails, which is the challenge. But we're we're I'd working give you through some suggestions. Right I would love to hear them. <laughs> um, I mean, it's also if your audience is listening to podcasts too. I guess you could just put them on your site. You don't have to yeah. do it as a formal podcast, like on iTunes or something. Right, right, exactly. That's probably a good way to start, absolutely. Who is your audience? Is it more younger, older, both? Yeah, very, very good question. Right now, it's like, it's between 18 and like 35. That's our, that's our audience that is consuming, I'll say. And, and at the same time, that's kind of who we're targeting, you know, is probably that audience. We have uh, an existing customer base um probably in the you know gosh it, it ranges from like i would say 35 up to you know 60 years old or nail technicians but we're really that's what i was gonna say because going from wholesale and salons yeah that's gonna be older crowd it is an that. older crowd it is it is absolutely and and you know we're we're a little bit older ourselves i'm 44 my brother's 46 um you look about 28 Thank you very much, man. When I, very, before we started, fun. I was watching the videos. And I'm like, 20 <laughs> years. This guy looks about 20 years old. Was he like two? His mom was doing, having to do nails when he was three years old. <laughs> What's that's, going on here? That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're we're you know we're we are looking to you know connect. You know, I would say with the consumer at this point, majority of our of our connections in business has been B two B. It's been to salons, and so today, 
you know, we're through our social media, you know, we're trying to, you know, build that awareness and that consumer awareness yeah. of our brand. Talk about the evolution of the, the marketing a little bit, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. So early on, it was more, well, I'll, I'll reverse because it's really interesting how this whole thing got started and how your sure. mom actually started it. But um, we'll talk about that in a second. But sure. the wholesale piece, um, you said more trade shows yeah. and salons. How did you get into to all these salons? So dealing with the salons, it honestly was through our trade shows. Really that's, fra- how, that's I feel how we like built it's, it. Is it very fragmented? I feel like it's a very fragmented industry. Like everyone kind of has – you know, it's not like a conglomerate of salons. Like this person has right. this one. They're all kind of independent. Yeah. So I would think it'd be hard to kind of get into all these places. That That is a accurate observation. It's um, very fragmented to the point. It's funny. We just had a meeting this week discussing how fragmented – the uh you know the b2b side of of our industry is and what you said is correct it's majority what we call their booth renters so what they do is the salon owner like owns the space and it's it's almost like a real estate game more than anything and what the the salon owner will do is rent out the chairs and that's really his or her business the salon business the majority and then nail technicians or hairstylists will rent the mm. chair wow. or the space and they run their own businesses so they're like individual owners it's even more fragmented than i thought it's yeah like, it's very wow. it's very fragmented um so it's it's interesting there hasn't been a lot of like salon chains that have been successful it's the turnover also with nail technicians in a salon because they, they can move around a lot. There, there's a lot of turnover. So that's the biggest challenge. You have to have a license to actually do services. And so that's a small pool right there to pick from. But it's very fragmented. It is. So how do you market? How do you reach all these individuals? Um, it, back in the day, it was through trade shows. We would literally shake hands meet individual nail technicians um and salon owners and make a connection that way and and that's how we built our business was one nail technician that used to be our statement we used to say it's one nail technician at a time it's shaking one hand at a time um and then so the transition into social it's way more efficient obviously because we can reach you know 10,000 20,000 nail technicians even though it's fragmented we can hit them all at the same time through social, which is, which which is really nice, much more efficient. So I want to eventually get into your brother and you, but I want to, to rewind Mm. your dad's working two jobs. Yeah. He paid off the house and your mom does what? My mom calls me from college in 1992 and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm about an hour away and she's like, Hey, I need you to come down and sign some papers for me. Sure. Mom, no problem. I have no idea what she, you know, sign some papers. I'm 18 years old. <laughs> I, I show up at her office and she's like, okay, uh, I need you to, um, you know, write your dad's signature. I'm like, okay, sure. You know, he's not here. So I'm like signing my dad's name. This is like 27 years, whatever it is, signing my dad's name. And she's like, um, okay. Uh, thank you. And I'm like, what's that for? She's like, well, we just refinanced the house and we're pulling all the equity out for my business. And I was like, oh my God, what did I just do? Like, I just committed a freaking crime. Eventually my dad agreed to it later as he found out. He was like, that's okay. But he had no idea. My mom (laughs) did this and she believed in it so deeply. Like she really believed in it. And what was There's the original no way- idea for the business? Because it didn't start off at nails, right? Correct. It started off as like a what was called a post office express. And it's basically like a UPS store today before UPS uh, bought all these out. So she owned that. And her idea was to build that business and to grow it out. Gentleman walked in, saw that she had this huge space. And he wanted to rent the back part of her business out. So he said, hey, I'm, I manufacture these like nail kits for cosmetology schools. Let me rent out the back part. I can you know, sublease it to me. And um, she was like, great idea. I love that. And by the way, what are you doing? 
and he took her through what he does. I sell these kits to nail schools, and every six weeks they they have a new class coming in, which means new kits. My mom was like, I want in. It wasn't even like a question. This complete stranger, she's like, I want to partner with you. And this guy was like, okay, let's do it. And that's how she got into the business. I mean, yeah, very aggressive, very – it's just in her. So was your mom born here or somewhere else? No. She was born in Seoul, Korea. Um, She came to the United States in 1979, Hmm. 1978. And uh, through her company um, and saw an opportunity come, came to Los Angeles, met my dad. My, her car broke down. My dad fixed her car. And instead very of chivalrous. paying – Very chivalrous, yes. But he did request, you don't have to pay me for the car, but you have to let me take you out to, uh, to, to lunch. And she said yes, and that's how they met. Thank God. Um, and <laughs> that all worked out. Um, and then she ended up bringing her whole entire family from Korea to uh, to Southern California. She was responsible for bringing everybody. Um, and even at that time, like marrying outside of her culture was like a Your really dad is not Korean. No, my dad, uh, my dad's uh, Palestinian. He came here in 1977, and um, also when he met my mom, his side of the family was like what are you doing? Like, we don't, you know, the, both my parents were kind of like rebels. You know what I mean? Like, they're like, we don't care about our, you know, we love each other. So screw everybody. And I love that. That was a very, for me, it's like, I like that my parents both, they're very independent in their decision making. And like, we're not just going to go along with what you think, you know, we're going to, we're going to pull the trigger and and do what we feel. Um, and uh, yeah, so like my brother and I are this like bizarre, insane mix. The family parties, your dad find out finally that she had basically drawn all the equity out of the house. Yeah. So my mom handled all the finances and he just, he stayed out of the finances. So uh, he, he tried, my mom basically said that she lived at a, uh, or excuse me, she worked at a real estate company and so he would call and he would always try to track her down she gave him this number um my my dad worked like 15 hours a day so he was never home and um he got very suspicious like why is she never at this location and what would happen is it was a number that now that now i remember it was a number my mom gave him that was her friend that worked at a real estate and it was always like young's not here let me have her call you back and then she would call my mom and say hey your husband called call him So very quickly, he figured out something is up. And uh, finally, he just showed up at their business one day. He like this. This wasn't very long after he showed up and was like, what is this? And so the cat was out of the bag. Um, It was ugly. Why do you think she didn't tell him like she was worried that he wouldn't say no or she she knew he would say no. Mm. It wasn't even a question. And and my dad, um, there's no way he would have agreed to it. My mom, she's like, I want to do this and nobody's going to stop me. Mm. She just has that thing of like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to figure out, you know, how to get it done, whatever I need to do. Yeah. Um, What did did your dad do? Is he, he was, he was more conservative. Very, very conservative, very traditional, like, just hardworking, conservative, let's just pay this off. I don't want – like very risk averse. Yeah. And my mom is literally 180 degrees from that, like complete freaking opposite. Um, and he he was against it for many years. He was like, this is not working. And I mean, he wasn't wrong. It wasn't working in, in the beginning. It, it took a lot of time. And a lot of pain, like real, real deep, deep pain to, you know, get through this stuff. Um, Just because the kits weren't selling as as fast as people thought? That, and also there were a lot, like things, like their partner, this guy that my mom partnered with, he ended up, uh, he was basically telling customers, make your checks out to me, Mm. you know, to his name. And he was cashing the checks, so he was like stealing. They had to deal with that. There was a whole issue of – there was a lot of just – they tried things that didn't work out. 
and that cost money and they had no money. And so they were, my mom started hitting up, you know, her family for credit card. Let me borrow your credit card. Let me borrow money, you know, getting loans from family, just just things that didn't work out. And the debt kept on accumulating year after year to the point where, you know, the house was getting foreclosed on. I mean, we had, oh, we had so much debt, Jeremy. I can't, it's unless you've been through that kind of financial pain and stress it is the most it's just awful it's it's really and like you have to deal with it every day it's really really hard it is like really really yeah. hard um it, yeah, to, it's to one of the foundations that. right i mean uh food water shelter right and you're losing That's right those foundational things you can't think of anything like maslow's hierarchy of needs you can't think of anything else if those things aren't fulfilled at the bottom i imagine 110 percent um and at the same time like you know my my parents dynamic is not very good because of this financial stress so there's like arguing going on daily you know i it's it was it was awful i promised i was like i will never join the family business Never, ever. Because you know, whenever anyone says never, that's when it happens, right? It's like, welcome. <laughs> you might as well say you that have to arrived. Them, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. How much of this were they sharing with you? What point did they bring you into the conversation? So, I knew, I knew everything. I mean, at this time, I, I was, I was substitute teaching to support my music career. And I was literally giving half of my money mm. to my mom and my brother because they, there was no money coming in. So what was um, your music career? What were you doing? What's that? What were you doing in music? I was, I'm a drummer. Oh, okay. I, I haven't played in a while, but I was basically playing in like multiple Put that bands. In the next vlog. Like, I doing? know I need to. Exactly. I need to get that out there for sure. It was a lot. It was a great, actually it changed It was a big thing for me, like going out on my own and learning to sort of navigate in the real world of music, you know, trying to trying to make it. Um, But yeah, so I was doing that and supporting them as much as I could. So I knew everything that was going on Mm -hmm. with their business. Um, uh, It it got to a point where for me, I was like, should I like I didn't want to get involved. I did not want to get involved, but I was the only one that had good credit. My mom and my brother's credit was completely shot. And they were kind of looking at me a little bit like, hey, <laughs> you got credit cards. You're sleeping and, with your wallet really close. <laughs> yeah, like at my heart, like do not t- – like setting traps around my bed, you know. And it, I got to a point honestly where I was like, like let me – I have to try something, right? Because like yeah. it was miserable. So, um, and I wanted to help my family if I could. It's a really, really difficult situation. You know? It's a very difficult situation. You're like, I want to follow my dream if it's a musician, but I am obligated to my family to right. help them. It's right. That that's it in a in a nutshell. For me, it was like I, I have to try. Like my parents have been there for me, right? My dad, you know, paid for my my college education and turned wrenches and worked his butt off. I have to try something. So, so I did at that point, this was in 2000. I was like, Hey, you know, let me, let me come in. Let me see if I can help. And my brother and my mom were like, absolutely. Let's, let's see if we can do this together. And a funny thing happened at that point. Like, well, first of all, I went to the bank and unloaded my credit cards. That's the first thing, which was about 60 grand, you know, like 22% interest, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it's that got That was painful, but we didn't have a choice. So I was now, you know, officially in the business. And then it's like the a, mafia. Yeah, it is. It is. It's like 22%. I mean, it's like insane, you know, but that's what it was for cash advance at the time. Um, and a really interesting interesting thing happened, which was my brother, my mom, and I sat down, and we had an honest discussion of, okay, what are we good at here? You know, I know I can bring discipline to the table, and I'm like, I'm obsessive, compulsive, you know, insanely hardworking. So let me handle the just the inside of the business, like and the then operations. we 
the operations, mm-hmm. right? I can get really anal and kind of crazy about it. And then my mom is amazing with relationships. And so we had her on the purchasing side sourcing. And then my brother, phenomenal salesperson. And mm. so I basically, we said to my brother, don't worry about anything. Just focus on bringing in money. Mm. And it was a divide and conquer kind of a vibe. And right there with the three of us, you know, working together that with that efficiency, we started to see things very slowly turn. And it took us five years from that point, five years to get out of debt. Wow. Um, and then from there, we started to see things grow. But That's that was amazing. kind of a, yeah, it was a, it took eight years, eight years to, you know, where we were able to divide responsibilities and then another five to get back to even. So 13 years from the start of the business to get to where we started, which was no debt. <laughs> Just crazy, crazy. That's amazing, Habib. So in the 13 years, where did, did you see a, like inflection point, attraction point where you're like, yeah, like this is going where we want. Not a point where like, okay, you're slowly trudging along. What was that point right. where I see sort of a light at the end here? You yeah. Know? I don't know if you get a big account or you get, you know, something that fuels that. Yeah. It, you know what it was, it, when I first started, there was, we had a large account that just kind of signed on with us. So the timing was really good. And that was a result of my mom. She landed this account. Um, so that started a tweak, but we still had all this other like debt to deal with. And I would say like around two years in, so around 2002, we saw that we were paying very slowly, paying our debt down. And we saw the sales very slowly starting to grow. And I would say about two years in, we were like, I think this can actually work. So um, two years, about about the 10-year point from when we first started was when we saw that light. That's when we saw that light. That's amazing. Crazy. And your brother, though, yeah. was in firefighters training. He was. So th- this was when my mom – before, right when she started the business, which was around 92, he was going, he was going to fire technology school and my mom called him up and was like, Hey, I have this opportunity, this business opportunity. I just met this gentleman that walked into my postal, you know, uh, express. And she literally said, drop, drop it, come down, talk to this guy. My brother talked to the guy They went on a sales call. And he converted the guy sold like 10 kits in like two minutes. And my brother was like, I'm going to be rich in like two years. (laughs) So he dropped out of fire school was like, I'm going to go where the money is. Um, Didn't work out like that. But yeah, he's a total. My brother's an athlete. I mean, he is like he loves golf. He was like a hardcore skier, mountain climber, nail tech um, now. But a very, very talented guy. Very talented. So you. 13 years, that's what, you know, always, it's a 10 years, you know, uh, overnight success after 10 years, 13 years, 20 years, whatever it is, because people only Correct. see what you're doing now. They right. don't see all the the crap that you had to go through to get to where you are. But um, what was the next milestone? So you, that's a huge milestone, you know, celebratory, getting out of a pile of debt and seeing everything grow. What was the next yeah. major milestone for, for you and the family? The next major milestone for us, we were looking at that time at, you know, we were looking at revenue. So the first one was breaking like the million dollar sales mark. That was like kind of, and we, we had done that in that, in that, on the way to paying off our debt. Then it was like, you know, can we, can we hit $2 million in revenue? Like, is that, can we double the size of the business after that point? Like when we cracked the two million, we were almost like, I think we're good. Like, and then things just started to get crazy. It just started to like the growth at that time within like a five year period, it was just hyper growth. It just started going, you know, absolutely crazy. But I would, I would think the first one was like obviously getting out of debt, but the million dollar mark in revenue was huge for us. But then after that, it was like, can we get to two? And then after that, it was like, 
you know, sky's the limit, maybe. Why do you think that is? Was it reorders from all the relationships that were coming in, or was it a new strategy? It was not a new strategy. It was what happened was we, our, our strategy, we could not penetrate the U.S. market because it was so competitive, and we did not have the money. So we looked outside of the U.S., mm. and w we started to do trade shows where there was a big international pre presence. So we started going to those trade shows. We started picking up international accounts where our competitors were not, and where we actually had a fighting chance of gaining market share in, in, in those countries where they just didn't have a huge presence. So that's we started building internationally like throughout Europe. And then – once once we grew that business, we started to market and advertise domestically. And then once we started to kind of grow the U.S. market, that's where we just saw things mm. like kind of get crazy. Amazing. So talk about some of the most popular the from a product line standpoint yep. and product yep. development. Yep. What what because you you know obviously we're not talking digital goods. You have to pay for goods to Correct. ship them out. So there's a big capital influx needed um mm -hmm. where do you start what did you have for you had the kits first what was the we next did. kind of iteration because if you go on your site there's a lot of different types of products yeah so we, we schools the school business and the kits like you said that was the beginning and then it got to a point where my my brother was like we have to have our own brand like you know our own, not just kits anymore, but we need our own brand so we can market to salons. And so he started Young Nails. This was in 98 or 99, I think. Basically, it's a great name. I mean, it's your mom's name, and it, yeah. it goes obviously well with because people want young. Right. Yeah. Nails. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And like the vibe of our company, we always say we're like a bunch of five year olds here almost, you know, screwing around. And there's a young, like, we have that sort of like vibe so it, it does work out um and that that was where the, the product development really took a turn you know he started building out um these real salon products and that then opened up the market for us to start you know connecting with salons versus just schools um and then the next so we had like our acrylics and gels like these are these are like your your traditional nail enhancements we've had that for many years and then in 2013 we decided to get into the nail polish business shockingly we never had a nail polish um we got into the nail polish game the reason why we waited there for so long was because nail polish is so competitive you're dealing with you know these huge brands iconic brands that's right, huge iconic brands, and to compete in that market, it's it can be very challenging. So we wanted to wait until we were ready, and we can we can you know give ourselves a fighting chance of competing. And that was the big one was nail lacquer in 2013, which is our Young Nails Caption Nail Polish. What's some of the favorite most popular products that uh, people can get? And by the way, anyone can check this check their out their stuff at YoungNails.com. It's N A I L S, not males, but Correct. but fingernails. Dot exactly. com. But yeah, uh, the, our number one product is a product that is called Protein Bond. Um, it's in a little tiny bottle, and it makes everything stay on the nails. Hmm. So you can use it with nail polish, you can use it with gels, or you can use it with like the hardcore acrylic enhancements as well. And it is our number one selling product. Hmm. Period. It just everybody. It's like a. Staple. Is there a common use case for it? Like they mostly use it for, you know, keeping something on, or what? What do people that, use it for? That's really it, right there, Jeremy. It's 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 a requirement um, to give the best bonding to mm. whatever enhancement you're putting on the nail. So if you're putting acrylic on or gel or nail polish, you got to put protein bond to make sure I it's going it. to stay on. Yeah, the so it's under nail preps and treatments that's it that's exactly yeah. it correct Do people ever use it for medical reasons like if they get split if they split their nails or they have um uh kind of fragile nails or no is it more you know for what sticking? it really is more just for the bonding Got it. um there are products out there we don't really have 
anything once you start getting into those types of issues and challenges. Um, but there are products out there, you know, that work well for, for those, for those challenges. So you're at the point where you guys are doing really well Correct. and, um, you have now kind of gone in, you know, from wholesale salon and then increased to consumer. Um, where's it next? What, you know, what's the future? That's, that's a great question. Um, the future for us is we want to connect with the consumer. We want to grow the brand. We want to have more consumer awareness. I mean, straight up, that's really what we want to do. Yeah. We've, we've connected with the professional and we have a great relationship with the professionals in salons all around the world. Um, we want to take it to that next step of really connecting yeah with the consumer and having them know who we are and our brand and um, ultimately just bringing some energy and excitement to the nail category the the nail like nails can it's become kind of commoditized in the last like four years the big brands that were in the market they sold out to um, these you know huge huge conglomerates and those conglomerates took the brands and kind of just suck the life out of them, to be honest with you. So we want to bring fun and energy and excitement back into the nail category. We want people to like, you know, when they think of nails to, instead of like, oh, it's just a color. I mean, you know, ultimately to, to, to connect with us and like, who are those two insane, crazy brothers in nail but to bring them, I'm sure bring you them stick some, out a little bit, yeah. Just a little bit, exactly, exactly. Um, but we want them to, we want to bring some excitement into it. Honestly, like it's, there's no reason it has to be, you know, like boring and and like where it is today. It's just there's no, there's no life in it, and like we're kind of tired of that. So we know we we can bring that. And on top of that, here's what the funniest part is: like, like we love sports. We love, uh, you know, I love cars, I love sports, I love nails, right? And like, so we can talk sports, we can talk, we can, all the like the manly stuff, right? You know, we can talk all that stuff. And then I can sit down with like the biggest beauty influencer in the world and like talk nails. And probably not just talk nails, but no way way more than any top beauty influencer in the world i know more than probably most of them hands down because we get into like the real like chemistry of it and why something works and why it doesn't and so well, yeah i mean when you manufacture fun. it what what about the challenges of that piece i mean there's business yeah. challenges of sales but then you're also manufacturing we are manufacturing. We're one of the few companies. So most nail polish brands in the market, most beauty products in the market, they're all they're all outsourced. Like everything, there's there's these companies that will make any beauty product you want, including nail polish, have it delivered to your door. You work with them to create the formula. We we do all that here. So um, we've got our chemists and we manufacture, we assemble, fill, we've got the automated machines here that can pump out, you know, 6,000 bottles a minute. Um, but all that's done on site oh. and it's hard. It is, it is it, like you said, the challenges associated with that are never ending. Um, it's you know, a lot of people ask, why do we do it? What's the point? Why don't you just outsource it? And we like having the control yeah. of our quality control is so freaking important to us. Yeah. Every single SKU we make, literally, it is checked. It is checked and it has to be approved no matter what. So that's how do a big you decide what to produce next? Because you're, you sound, I mean, you guys are innovating, you're looking at the trends. How yep. do you decide what's next? Yeah. So that it, it, it is a real kind of two part. It's it's our pulse on the market. So through social, this is why I love and we love social here. It connects us with what is going on right now in the market. And we can see like whether that's color or nail styles or nail art, we get an immediate feel. 
So that helps to drive innovation there. But also, like having that pulse on the market, we can we can start to dip into our experience and say, you know what, with the way things are going right now, I'm pretty sure product X that I've had on my mind for, for a few years is going to do really well here. Mm. And so that's how we go about it. And it's literally daily. Like we are talking about this every single day about new products, new innovations that we can bring to market. So we're constantly, as a small company, we can we can move really quick. Quickly. So we're, yeah, we're constantly launching new products all the time, which is so a lot of fun. How did you meet Ezreal? So I attended a an amazing uh, seminar in New York City. Um, it's Vayner Media does a seminar called Four Ds, and if you're if you consume any of Gary V's content, Gary Vaynerchuk's content, you're probably familiar with 40s. I was driving on the freeway one day and I was listening to his podcast and I'm like, you know what, I gotta go check this out. I went out there, it was it was amazing. And I had an opportunity to talk with, you know, when you're out there, you start to connect with a lot of his team, which is, they're just amazing people. And uh, one of the people on his team, you know, was kind of checking out our content and was like, hey, you guys could probably use a Facebook ads manager. What are you doing on Facebook? And I was kind of showing him. He's like, oh, you guys definitely need a Facebook ads manager. And so I was like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, um, well, where do I start? He's like, hold on. And he literally just goes on and tweets it out. Have this nail company looking for a Facebook ads manager. There's all these responses. Um, I saw Asriel. He's one of the first people that was on there. Um, he responded, I hit him up and we just connected, man. Mm -hmm. We had a great connection and, um, he coincidentally came down to San Diego for a conference he was speaking at. I'm in LA. I drove down there. We met, uh, we really hit it off. So, um, we're looking to start working with him very, very soon. Super excited about that. What else did you learn from, uh, the Vayner media? <sighs> mini oh my God. This is what I learned. Like the first thing that I learned was that, when you watch Gary, you don't realize like he's amazing. Like he is like unbelievably amazing. But what's more amazing is the people that work with him on his team. They are they're so incredibly uh, talented and very smart. But the biggest thing is that they're so nice. They're so nice. So when you go out there for the 40s, they're there to like really help you and connect with you and look at your business and, and give you some real like direction as to what to do. So then that, you know, once you experience that, your perspective of like, you know, Gary V and who he is completely changes. You're like, he's much more than even what we see on his content. Way, mm -hmm. way, way, way more. Nice. But, um, incredible team. Yeah. They really look to help, help brands. Um, it's, it's, it was, it was phenomenal. So, First of all, I want to thank you. This has been awesome and uh, very vulnerable with what has gone on, right? This is like really, yes. really treacherous, deep stuff that we've talked about. 100%. And so I appreciate you sharing. Um, and everyone should check out youngnails.com. And um, I always ask at the end... Um, on Inspired Insight or what sure. has been a low moment and then what on the flip side has been a, a proud moment because I find the low moments is kind of what shape yeah. our, um, you know, strengthen us for for the yeah. uh, the next step. I love that question. I actually just got goosebumps as you asked that. And I would say very recently, as much as, you know, about just over a year ago, we were at a point I would say 18 months ago, we were at a point where we were, we just flattened, plateaued. And honestly, I was like at a burnout. I was like, I don't know what else we can do to like grow our dang business, you know, just putting all this effort in. And then starting on the social media path, producing content at the beginning of that phase of producing content hit another low point because all of it. We were getting hammered by people like, what are you guys doing? What is this garbage? And then the turning point was slowly like looking at what we're doing, making little tweaks, making little tweaks, making little tweaks. 
12 months later today, it's like we're, we're seeing all of this working now. And it's like it was just such a hard transition, Jeremy. It was so hard because we were so used to doing print. Because it's customer print. facing? Is that why? It's it is it like you have to be transparent. You have to be. It's directly looking at your customers, and it's opening up yourself on camera, who you are. You're like opening your whole life to, and doing that and having people like, kind of hammer slam you, you, like <laughs> slam you, like, Jeez. who are you? Who is this? And it was hard. Like I really had to reinvent myself, and we had to reinvent our company. But now after 12 months of that and, and making tweaks, you know, looking at what's not working, what's working, optimizing, looking at what's not working, what's working, optimizing, continuing on that path, testing, testing, testing. Now it's like, it's, we're, we're seeing this change take place with our company and our organization. And is, it's so, it's amazing. It's amazing. So that's a real, that's a recent one that I can say and relevant to people that may question should they make this change onto doing a podcast or doing social or anything like that. I'm telling you, yes. And it's, it's going to take time to make that transition because it's hard because you have to learn. Yeah. But 1000%, it's like, like I, we're on the right path now. Yeah. And it's, it feels good. I think you had much harder times than that, so it was probably easier to make that transition, I imagine. I, I can handle it. That's the thing. Because we've been through such gnarliness in our growth and development as a company, but it's still hard. It's still hard, right? Like it's really it's a recent hard that I can identify with. Yeah, nothing compares to the financial difficulties way back. Like nothing. There's nothing worse than that. Um, but something that's relevant to today and what we did recently, I would say I would say that's it. What drives you now to keep going? Because, you know, like you said, when you say, oh, we reached 2 million, oh, we're good, right? Yeah. But something yeah. keeps driving you further. Is it running from, you know, it's either running towards something or running away. Away is, from something, yeah. What is driving you now? Because, you, yeah. can, you know, you can become complacent, be like, yeah, the social thing's cool. We don't have to make, a, you have a rigorous strategy for social media, right? <laughs> Yeah, 100. Yeah, so, yeah very. And that's on top of everything else you have to do. So it's not right. like you're just doing that all day. But Correct. Um, what's driving you now to just. Yeah, really good question. And, and this is the answer for me is I've come to realize and it took me a while to figure this out about myself that I like when things are insane and nonstop that's truly, and I've been like this my whole life, but it's only recently that I've come to accept at 44 years old that I've finally accepted who I am as a person, that I like that. Hmm. And it's funny, when we started doing, we, were, we started out with three, we started out with two videos a week, okay, a year ago. And then we kind of got that down and then we added a video. And I literally had a, a conversation with my art director as well as our director of education. I said, I don't like this because now it's like, it's kind of automatic. I'm like, I, we, no. Yeah. Like, so we added like two a pressure more, makes more videos. Type and, of thing. You just needed, you got. That's right. You, your strength, your muscle for that built up and you were fine with it. So you wanted to add more. I want to add more. And I realize I like working the amount of t like I'm I'm literally working you know, fifteen hours a day. Thank God I have a my my wife. She really is amazing. She she knows who I am, but that's that's the driver. Is I love figuring things out. I'm just a, a naturally curious person, and it's like how do we make this social thing work? How can we grow into the consumer market, going from the professional market in nails? I'm genuinely curious about how you make that transition. And putting the pieces together to figure out how to do it. And so, and that's what it is. It's just, it's my curiosity that I, it will always be there. And, and I, I really do love, um, the grind every single day. Like I just do. So, um, what role does your mom play now? She's more of, she does purchasing still cause she is still good at it, but she'll come in for two hours and she's got a team and her team is amazing. They do an incredible job. 
she's got the relationships, but my mom is 70. She's going to be 75 years old. She comes in. She'll do her thing. If she wants to stay all day, she'll stay all day. If she doesn't feel like it and she wants to go down to the local casino and play some Kino, that's what she does too. <laughs> <laughs> she loves her Kino, man. Well, Habib, I, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Everyone should check out youngnails.com. And then where else should they check out on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook? You can go to Young Nails Inc. on, on uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, uh, all of them. Cool. Check it out. These guys are funny. And uh, nails, 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 right? Nails, nails, nails. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Pleasure. So what's the first thing you need when you start a business? You need money. My father had worked two jobs fixing cars for a good part of his life already. Basically had our house virtually paid off. My mom opens up a line of credit on the home and pulls all the equity out of the house and invests in the business. Here's the thing, my dad had no idea. Yes, they're still together today. <laughs> they're still together. Now, I'm not saying that this is how every business should get started, but it's how ours got started. So with that money, my mom basically, she was able to take on a new lease at a warehouse location. At that time we had, it's about 1800 square feet with a, an office in the front and a warehouse in the back so that we could properly start manufacturing cosmetology kits. I remember very, very, very clearly during that time a feeling of uneasiness and nervousness because I knew my mom had started in something. She had no experience in the industry. She had no business experience. But one thing that woman had was a load of guts. You wanna talk about courage? She's the most courageous person I've ever met in my life. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get back to my reading. So you're slacking? You Which did? one's mine? This is mine. I've already made Greg's, and this is yours. <laughs> did you understand? Would you like some coffee? Because I actually no. don't mind getting it for you. No, no. Them? Yes. No. You, no. No. Yes to the, the real boss. I will make the real boss Which coffee. Which one's my coffee? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there you so, go, sir. Yeah, so, see. Uh -huh. If you want to do something, you want it done right, Oh, just he drinks all cream, not Dude, a I could have just put coffee in this for you. <laughs> yeah. Got to do it yourself. Uh, yeah. Huh? Uh, yeah, you took off from my job. I have to take off from <laughs> it. How much are you going to pay me? How did you start the business? Okay, so you guys finished your high school. Mm -hmm. So I tried to keep myself busy because I was a full-time mother. And since you guys went to college, I have nothing to do. So, I said, so you're bored? 
Yeah. 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 Like it now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I opened the uh, mailbox, etc. Like a UK store. Right. And then one day, the one of the customer walked in. He has uh, full of nail products, mm -hmm. and showed to me. Can you uh, let me use corner of your office? I told him, yeah. So when you open it, I look at it. It was full of nail products. I say, what are you doing? He says, this is a nail business. If you get into it, you're gonna make a millions of dollars. <clears throat> so how much? Fast. You fast. Fast. Really fast. Right. So I couldn't pay the rent regularly. So this is a chance I can really pay the rent on time. So your existing business of mailboxes, etc., was struggling. This guy came in, offered a proposal to make to partner with him to make cosmetology kits. Yes. And you thought it could be a good way to pay your rent on your That's on the right. right. That's right. So we started buying the products. From the, I told him, no problem, we go 50-50. And uh, you use my office. I didn't tell my husband what I'm doing. You didn't tell your husband what, what you I'm were doing. doing? Yeah, I didn't tell him. I just continue. One day I'm gonna make so much money so he doesn't have to worry. But he found out because all the creditors keeps calling. And uh, so he told me, what are you doing? So I opened the business. Okay, let me come see what you're doing. And from that point, my debt was really, really my line of credit, house line of credit plus all my credit card. Debt was so high and uh, sometimes Sometimes they cut off my gas, so cut it off because I couldn't pay the bills. This is, I asked this question with, with all like curiosity and sometimes I think about it. I really think about this and it, 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 it makes me, you were 49 years old, right? Yeah. So you have a dream, you're 49 years old, kids are out of the house, that most people would never think about starting a business at 49 years old. That, I mean, to a yeah. lot of people, it's crazy. Yeah, but 49 years old, that's just number. When you have a dream, doesn't matter what age, even 60, 70, you have a dream, you go for it, you're gonna reach it no matter what. A numbers doesn't mean anything. 49, uh, 59, but weren't you afraid that it was just gonna completely no, fail? No, I never have any doubts. I am gonna just go for it. Whatever it takes, I'm not gonna give it up. I'm still go. whatever it is it takes. I never stop, even I'm 74 years old and I started 49, number doesn't mean anything. I think what is interesting, you don't go back and forth thinking too much, you know you want to do it, you know you love it, and you go. And yeah. you just start doing it. Yeah, still same thing. <laughs> Did I have a chance that I'm still doing the same thing? Never change. This is true. You do the same thing. Oh, for sure, I, I, yeah, I definitely yeah. uh, Even your that. college time, you yeah. do the same thing, so you got the good blood like your mother. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a little boom. All right, all right. Like that. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. This is Wilbur. He's very naughty. Say hi, Wee Wee. Say hi. <laughs> what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.